there's a couple of initiatives around identifiers for organisations, which is a much more complex uh, problem than identifiers for people. Uh, and again, they said the most biggest uh, thing to get right there is who would manage such a system, and that's particularly difficult because with people, it's easy to say this person is responsible for their identifier. For organisations, that, that's sometimes less clear. Um, sustainability, though, is probably the biggest issue. Who is going to pay for the infrastructure we have now in the future, and who's going to pay for the future infrastructure we need to do what we want to do? Um, generally speaking, and, and specifically to metrics, uh, they're big questions, and I think it's getting much harder and harder. You know, the, ev every year, it seems to be that those altruistic uh, ways we've relied on in the past where money's come from somewhere just about maybe a grant continuing starting just as only if a grant ends or one government funding something or one university funding something that model seems to be uh, no longer something we can rely on uh, we probably should never have been relying on it as much as we were uh, things like art the physics archive have gone through points where they uh, yeah, were of difficulty um, such a, an essential source, such, a, such an essential bit of infrastructure for physics, that um, their funding at points was, was difficult. So getting that, that, working out the models of sustainability in those areas is so crucial. And if I'm going to point out, there's a, there's a recent, in terms of um, uh, sustainability of, of, lot of, uh, of, of scholarly um, publications, there's a recent report out uh, from the University of California, um, Davis, um, called the um, Pay It Forward Project. A really worthwhile report if, if you're interested in that area. They did a lot of work around how sustainable a world of our APCs, article processing charges, could be if you flipped today from subscriptions for journals to a fully open access. And their conclusion from the four large research universities they looked at was uh, there's no easy answer at the moment. Those universities should be paying far more than the current library budget to pay for the open access charges they would face um, and, and may well face in the future. But there's a lot more to it than that, so I do recommend and uh, read. One of the key questions of sustainability, I, I think, is, is, this, is this thing around the global, the national and, and the local, the organisational. Most, I'd say, uh, infrastructure should be or, need, or tends to be, uh, lends itself to be global identifiers, metrics, databases, citations. These, we all work in, in a global world. That's a truism. Um, so uh, yeah, there's no point re replicating this at a national level. However, um, finding sustainability, finding funding at a global level is hard. Um, yeah, traditional funding sources such as governments happen at a national level. There is some um, activity obviously at the EU level uh, here. Um, but generally speaking, finding solutions that can work uh, internationally are difficult. Uh, one solution is, is partnerships between different organisations, but they, they have their own issues as well. In terms of funding, there seems to be um, three models. The, the first is that, that small groups can often find a way of sustaining themselves. There's a, there's a nice example called CCDB, which is the Cambridge Crystallography Data, uh, uh, data Centre. Um, uh, and amongst them, they, they found a model which can work there to fund um, a service which, which is essential for a fairly niche um, set of researchers. Beyond that, you've got, you've got uh, a subscription model um, and also a taxation model, so, you know, relying on uh, larger entities to fund some sort of over, overarching piece of infrastructure. Not necessarily governments, it could be universities or other organisations. Um, Moving on from there, the final point they made was, was insurance. And by insurance, I mean how can we ensure this piece of infrastructure will be there tomorrow um, and available as it needs to be tomorrow and not taken away from us. The, the key things there, of course, are, are um, making the data open, making the, the, the components of it open, the software open, the li open licensing, so that if, there's a, if there is a change of ownership, if, if, it, if something does happen, um, we don't, as a community, lose it, um, both losing the data or just losing um, how it operates, how it, how it works. There are, there's, there's obviously an example of things like SSRN that's recently um, been bought by Elsevier. Um, there are 
increasingly seems to be sort of walled gardens, things like ResearchGate, at academia.edu. These are collecting a lot of data in the, which is kind of key, which is part of the scholarly record. How, how will we access that in the future? How will we, even, well, even if, it, even if it exists in the future, even if, it, if it's still operating in the future, how do we access that? How do we refer to that? There, especially in, in terms of metrics, there could be some really interesting um, links there inside those, those systems, but we just don't know. We just don't have access. And if we do have access, it's via limited APIs, um, which I'm not always convinced are, is a, um, good enough. Moving on into perhaps metrics, I, I think this is a huge gap in this area. The, 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 it seems to be when we've done some work here around this, all the data we need, or most of the data we need, doesn't seem to be uh, there. If, if you want to start working with citations or starting working with articles, trying to find an open data set to start playing with um, is difficult. Uh, there are clearly resources, there are clearly things you subscribe to uh, and make access to, but trying to use those in a way that you can um, merge them together, link them together, it, it's difficult. And, and certainly accessing uh, various indicators and citation counts um, is either not there at all or limited. Um, so I think one of the big pushes would be sort of how, how can we improve open data in this area? Uh, one, one final thing to say is around um, when I were interested in it is uh, books, book chapters, monographs, the long form, um, especially for the humanities. They, it, the long form is still so critical and, and will continue to be uh, for the humanities. Um, it's such a different area. I think it is neglected in terms of uh, you know, things like open access. It, it's such a different um, state of play. Things like green and gold access just don't apply for monographs in the same way. Um, it's an area where there's limited funding anyway, so when a monograph costs a lot more to produce, the equivalent of an article processing charge for a monograph, uh, who's going to fund that? It, it, it's, it's questionable. Um, and there's a growing number of academics wanting to publish and fewer publishers willing to publish um, and fewer readers willing to buy uh, and libraries willing to buy. So there's, there's a real issue here on sustainability. Um, but the area again lacks metrics to really help in that area. Um, it, it just seems to be an area which we, we need to explore more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, then I think it's it's time to, to move uh, to the audience. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. I saw a number of people already fidgeting with uh, anxiety and willingness to participate. So we have a number of do we have some comments or questions from the audience. Uh, you see that the two topics, on the one hand, we had first the issue of the current databases, inclusion versus exclusion. On the other hand, the longer term future. So Gunnar, uh, you have the micros, please. Over there. I remember at an earlier conference in this series, I think it was 10 years ago, one of the pioneers in this field said, the world of scholarly publishing is endless. And that was said in the uh, defense of the core journal. Saying that is the same as saying, I have got the best possible database. Um, I think uh, Eric Arcambo is right that Eugene Garfield in his time had to make that defense, but I think you are also right in saying that in our times that defense is not needed anymore. It is possible to create a comprehensive uh, representation of scholarly uh, publications in all fields and in all countries. And I think there are trends that are going in this direction, not only the technical development. There's an international convergence on, in, on scholarly standards for publishing. Make me let me take one example from the humanities. 
it is now common practice in journals in humanities to publish with abstracts and if I affiliation information in English. That was not the case 10 years ago. Then there's the heavier weight on societal relevance these days, which means that publishing in different languages will not go away. And also during these 10 years, the humanities, social sciences, and engineering sciences have insisted on keeping their specific formats for publishing, such as the peer-reviewed conference uh, series, the monograph, and the edited books, because they represent different methodologies and organizations of research that are needed in those fields. So the many languages and the different formats will not go away. But another thing has happened in between. It has been demonstrated in an article in Scientometrics that it is in fact possible if you define scholarly publishing in the right way, for example, require that publishers and journals should represent several institutions, not one, then the world of scholarly publishing is not endless. It's only dynamic. It may be growing, but it's not endless. You can define it. So 100% coverage is possible. And I think we're moving forward to towards this. It becomes perhaps a com question of commercial viability, but it cannot only stop there. And I think there will be a kind of impatience in future years, well, why we're not reaching that goal. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And my question is mostly for uh, our Latin American colleagues, but also for the second hat of the Russian colleague as a representative of a Russian Academy. Well, my question is, uh, you are talking about invisibility of uh, journals, especially the journals of your region. You are proposing several very interesting and even very successful initiatives. My question is, why is not considering in the regions uh, to set up an uh, open access mega journal. Hi, I'm Thomas Ciardi from SLU, University of Sussex. Uh, it's a very quick question um, also the, to the um, uh, something Reuters. Um, the regional databases, I mean, they look fascinating, uh, but when you say that these reconcile the, the uh, core collection and the rest of the collection, it actually seems to me that it actually creates more barriers. You're separating them. You're separating regional journals as the peripheral journals as the ones which are less important, and the core collection, which is the core collection. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, it's in the world. It's the core collection versus the rest. Um, the question is um, um, about this uh, core periphery that does not exist anymore. I think it still exists. It's just layered differently. Uh, so you have layers of peripheries that uh, access or not to the tools. Um, my, my question goes that I don't think it's a problem with the journals. Uh, I created uh, with my colleagues a journal that is indexed in Web of Science and Scopus in French, only published in French. Uh, we are leaders in the Social Studies of Science now journal, recognized. I've been seven years um, chief editor of Revue d'Anthropologie des Connaissances. And it has been uh, recognized because of the peer reviewing system we used, not because of the machinery, because of the technique, because of the databases. 
just because the people we select that do the job begin to localize it as a good journal. Now, this, our problem is not with the journal or the databases, by, but with the institutions that do oblige people that come from peripheries to publish in journals that are very difficult to access to. So I'd like to know what is your take on the role of the institutions? Yeah, thanks everyone. I have a couple of questions. One is, um, are any of you thinking about the dialing back of the use of uh, bibliometrics f around assessment? I mean, there's a huge sort of bureaucratic burden that goes along with this, and there's more resources that are being devoted to evaluation of work each year, it would seem, you know, just according to estimates that I've seen. And then the second question is, uh, is inclusivity a uh, strong enough uh, definition of diversity or intellectual diversity? You know, in, in with small businesses, if they are put onto the second or the third page by page rank at Google, basically their business disappears. The fact that you're in there somewhere, even if you're beer buried as a kind of a, you know, less si significant or less central or less mainstream, form of knowledge, how do, you, how do you correct for that simply through inclusivity or do we need some other methodology for this? Okay, uh, thank you very much. My name is André, I'm from Brazil, from Capes, which was mentioned. Uh, I believe I don't have a question, I have uh, not a problem because uh, it was mentioned that uh, all the time, because of rankings, people are trying to publish at the best and the best and the best magazines. But we have a problem with the amount of publications, too. Uh, it's the, the old idea of average. It's like we are at a bar and we calculate the average income of everyone there. And then Bill Gates gets inside, so the average goes skyrocket. And the same happens with science, we have the Bill Gates of science, guys who are like machines uh, publishing, and they publish a lot. And since we evaluate uh, uh, the development of the course and the quality of programs based on production, uh, what happens is that it skyrockets every time we evaluate because we calculate an average of production. And everybody tries to reach that average the next cycle, and the next cycle, and the next cycle. So the average keeps going up, as it was mentioned. So it creates kind of a problem, because uh, scientists have to publish more and more and more. So uh, my question, if it is a question or a, ref a reflection, is what's the way out? So, so what's the way out? Um, what we'll do, we'll close the session with two minutes uh, with, uh, for each of the speakers. And I should say that this session is sponsored by RISIS, which is a European project in which a variety of organizations in the field uh, are participating, among those uh, Ingenio. And uh, it's one of the main sponsors of the conference. And RISIS is going to present us the database that it has been creating in the last three years. I believe. And this will happen right after this. So we have two minutes for each of us, and then we move to the databases that RISIS has created. Okay. Shall we start with David? Okay, then very brief. Uh, I think that uh, several words have been mentioned in, in the panel and, and in the audience that uh, uh, I would like to summarize saying that, well, today we live in a plural world, and we should keep that in mind and, and make the most of it. Uh, I think I welcome the initiative of uh, uh, Thomson Reuters have going to the regions and trying to work with the people in the region. But still, I, I think that within the regions there is also variation, there is also plurality, and we have to keep in mind to have more databases like uh, the ones you are promoting in these different regions of the world, but also other independent uh, 
databases that bring in uh, different things because this is one of the great things of, of the scientific effort in the world. And obviously today the non-OECD world is much larger, has many more people than the old uh, world where until well into the 20th century science took place. And it's obvious that there is pressure to admit other ways of doing things or other subjects, other things that comes from reality that have to be uh, um, included into these things. We were talking about inclusion before, that is the kind of things. Uh, then the challenge, I think that the, the, the the greatest challenge here, as you said, well, coexisting research communities, great, I, I, I admit that. Uh, but then interoperability, uh, compatibility of the systems is, is the next step we have to move forward. And this is one of the things that I was reading in the, in the blog uh, from LSC last week saying that, well, that probably Latin America fails to come up in systematic searches, largely due to the inadequate use of domain names and metadata schema. These are technical things that have to be solved. And, and we have many other such challenges we have to uh, solve. No, interoperability, compatibility, and you mentioned sustainability, you know, uh, which I've, uh, of the infrastructure, uh, this is uh, crucial. Uh, why we haven't gone into open mega journals in Latin America so far? Well, I think because we, we, we are strangled by the uh, very narrow criteria of the Latin American science councils in the several countries. They have not yet understood what is the way forward in the future. Not necessarily more papers, different forms of communication, uh, and, and for the transition mega journals, I think it's important. I cut that because otherwise you are going to cut my head. <laughs> Chris? I'll briefly address a couple of the points raised over here. In terms of uh, bibliographic rankings, and are we putting too much into them, too much effort into them, are they too bureaucratic? Um, I think the first is quite a big question, which partly why we're here. It, yeah, um, clearly, we are not in full control of, of whether they're used or not. There, there are governments and funders, etc., cetera, who, who um, are interested in metrics, interest, interested in, in rankings, etc. cetera. Um, it's in our interest to make sure they are uh, useful and good uh, metrics and that they, they are transparent. Um, but there is a point that these things need to become a, a less bureaucratic, more efficient. I think over time, technology and the way it should link up with each other. There are too many separate silos um, of, of databases where you have to rekey in information um, over time. That, that should get better. In terms of discovery, uh, which I, I could, <laughs> um, one of my interests, the, I mean, in terms of Google, there's very limited what we can do. It, it, Clearly, one of the key things about Google is the more people will link to something, the more it will raise its profile. There's probably an argument there that um, something written based on an article, such as a blog post, um, which has a wider appeal, may be a way of helping uh, the article itself be, uh, be found. Um, the whole area around library discovery systems, uh, which, which ideally people would use in academia, um, though clearly, obviously, people don't. Um, they are taking steps forward, I think, in, in, in how uh, scholarly content can be more easily found. Uh, and, and over time, they're, they're getting better. Again, they're, they're mainly based on commercial systems and databases. Thank you. Valentin? Um, I also want to address the same question, um, and also the theme which I heard in a couple of other questions. That's the theme of, um, quote, unquote, significant and insignificant science. Um, every time um, I hear about it, I always want to ask, in what context? Because I think that's uh, the really the key question here. Uh, when we talk that it's, we, do, we don't see certain research because it's quote-unquote insignificant, in what context it's insignificant? Um, I think uh, if you do a research, uh, let's say, on um, agroecology in Brazil, then it's very likely that publications in the CEO database uh, are the most important for you. And in that context, that's the core uh, of, what you are, uh, of what you are looking at. And I believe that um, our job uh, as the providers of informational tool is to provide the correct context that every researcher and every field can construct 
the set of instruments which is the most appropriate uh, to his or her research interests. And that, of course, relates not only uh, to uh, the data itself, but also to the metrics. Um, there was another question about open access. Uh, if I understood it correctly, I can just say that we do promote uh, the open access generally in all our information instruments. Uh, and most of the journals, for example, in the Russian citation uh, database are open access journal. Um, and finally, uh, there was a specific question on the metrics. Um, and I need to apologize because I didn't hear it very well since it was coming from the very back of the room. Um, so I want to ask you either to repeat it or maybe uh, afterwards I can comment, yeah, uh, we can talk more about it and I will be happy uh, to talk in greater details about the metrics. Um, I think it was um, about the correlation, if I understand right, between the metrics in the original citation databases and um, the metrics in a core collection. Um, these two are different sets of data, so uh, you can now come up with a different set of indicators for each of those databases individually or for all data sets on the Web of Science platform. So again, that uh, gives a flexibility to the researchers and decision makers, but also want to say that creates an interesting opportunity uh, for the decision makers to make customized set of indicators uh, which would be more responsive to societal problems because we can put than uh, the data on scientific productivity in the context of uh, specific regions and specific countries. Rick? I spoke for too long, so I'll be really short this time. Uh, I'd just like to thank my, uh, my friend here from Thomson Reuters because he's proving our point. If you look at the number of citations from Russia to this article, it says that basically a lot of journals in Russia should go to the core if we were considering the citation network correctly. I think in the future we have to abolish this distinction between the center and the core because the core is not computed correctly and we have to bring, I know it's difficult for commercial company because you have to bundle things for marketing reason and all that kind of things. I, so I, I know the difficulties and we shouldn't be naive about it. I mean commercial companies have their own constraint and, and you know, it's, it's nice for us to say everything should be free and, and we should abolish companies, but they are there, they're paying a service, they have challenges, but at the same time, we have to work together, have a, a conversation, because these distinctions are not helpful and they're actually hurting both the use of of the articles by putting them in the corner saying, this is peripheral, you're not interested, and also it hurts measurement because this putting things in small categories where you only have access to certain categories of data is not good for measurement. Annabelle? Okay. <clears throat> okay, J just a comment on, on my colleague from, from CAPES. The <clears throat>